Hello everyone, it's me again, Matt. Hope you're having a wonderful day. We're talking about tank upgrades. I have done quite a few videos actually on tank upgrades in the past, whether it be the Challenger 2, the M60, the T72. We have all sorts of packages that are available for tanks out there in the modern battlefield. But it does raise the question as to why is it so many countries are relying upon upgrading vehicles and making the best of as to what they have than just designing a completely new vehicle. Now that is somewhat of a rhetorical question. In fact, it's a completely rhetorical question because most people have the common sense to realize that yes, they do this because it's money. Money is obviously the key factor when it comes to designing a new vehicle, governments, politics, etc. And if you need to design a new vehicle, it's a very big endeavor. Whereas upgrades quite easily come across in the market as being something quick and easy to install that somewhat bring a main battle tank to a higher standard. But it's hard to say nowadays if that's still the case. Retrofitting armored fighting vehicles in real life is a relatively common way of increasing their combat value. The word itself means adding new technology or features to older systems. But when talking about armor in retrofit particularly, the meaning usually shifts towards replacing existing vehicle components with more modern ones. Now while this approach might seem sensible at first glance, retrofitting vehicles comes with a large number of drawbacks, some of which I'm going to talk about today. The first thing that needs to be said about retrofitting vehicles or upgrading them is that when it comes to increasing combat value, purchasing more modern vehicles is always better than retrofitting old ones. Of course, there are many exceptions to this rule, but as a common basis, it's pretty standard as to that is the way to go. For example, when the chassis of a vehicle is sufficiently modern and its actual vehicle producer is doing the upgrade, it still works. While in theory, it might seem a viable course of action to, for example, equip an older tank with a bigger gun, this approach actually presents a number of difficulties that can be practically impossible to overcome. Some examples of what I want to talk about today. First of all, compatibility of parts. A tank is more than just a sum of parts. One vital aspect of the industry know-how is putting the right parts together. Often parts are actually designed from initial stages of development onwards to work together and undergo rigorous testing. Upgrades to existing vehicles by original vehicle producers, such as KMW for the Leopard 2 MBTs, are mostly exempt from this category due to the manufacturer's know-how but various third-party kits for tanks can seriously impact vehicle performance. It's almost like buying a normal car that you have today and putting non-regulatory OEM parts on there. Sometimes you're not going to get the best quality of parts that could actually cause more damage to your vehicle than upgrading it. The same applies for tanks. For example, putting too much additional armor on a vehicle will result in stress suspension, which in turn will result in poor reliability, additional maintenance needs, and potentially the power pack or the suspension itself failing. This is something clearly you don't want to happen on the battlefield. Now there are people out there and engineers that try their best to design this kind of upgrade package to coincide with the kind of weight of the vehicle or to coincide with the way in which it can, I guess, compensate for those kind of things. But it's always a chain reaction to something else, whether it be costs, whether it be difficulty in repairing, etc, etc. The second part is armor integrity. This is especially relevant to the T-5455 vehicle series, but can apply to many others as well. The armor of any tank is designed with integrity in mind. In effect, this means the nominal protection value of the armor only applies when the armor part itself is not compromised by penetration. Once the armor's structural integrity is compromised, the part no longer offers the protection it is rated at even if the armor fracture is relatively small. In other words, drilling a hole into an armored plate to mount a new retrofitted upgrade module is generally really not a good idea and will result in significant loss of potential protection values. An interesting side effect of integrity loss is the influence of old World War II field penetration tests. These were performed against captured or knocked out vehicles, usually multiple times in a row. Shooting the front of a captured panther seems like a good idea to determine whether your guns are successfully able to break through. But once the plate is penetrated or even compromised of any kind by non-penetrating hits, breaching it becomes much, much easier, leading to some strange penetration results. Unfortunately, back in the day, metal was a commodity and getting a fresh panther every time or replacing the panther with fresh metal each time 
not only compromise the results, but compromise the fact of needing more resources to actually build tanks that go fight panthers. Another big component is vehicle age. It is not possible to cheat time, and material is no exception. In terms of quality, even if you devise a modern armoured kit for a T-55 or older T-72 variants, in the end it's still being applied on a tank which in some cases are 50 years old. An example, there are multiple T-55 tanks still fighting in Syria today. Syria purchased 951 T-55 Alpha and 380 T-55 AK or Command Variant tanks from Czechoslovakia between 1971 and 1981. While many vehicles from this original import run have already been destroyed or phased out, some of the vehicles we are seeing on the battlefield today are 40 to 45 years old and have been actively used in since their arrival. Although many of their internal parts have been switched out since then, there is one component that cannot be switched, the vehicle chassis itself. As time progresses, the quality of the chassis degrades and retrofitting such a machine with modern parts, even if successful, is mostly kind of a gamble and a lottery as of the integrity of the chassis could be compromised by its age alone. I know for a fact when driving in my own armoured fighting vehicle in the British Army with the Warriors, if you hit a rock or a bump too hard as you're driving it, you are structurally damaging the hull of the vehicle. Tanks are tough things, they're solid metal for the most part, but metal does fatigue, chassis do fatigue. It's just like driving your pickup truck, or driving your car off road, or your jeep, whatever you want to be. If you push that metal to its extreme, especially over 45 years of external pressures and strains, including weathering, you are going to put unnecessary strain on the chassis of the vehicle, and therefore it's just totally not going to be suitable to go against you know, other armoured targets or into a firefight or into a combat scenario. Of course, as I said, tanks are very tough machines, but they can only take so much, and metal will eventually get to the point where it cannot withstand those kinds of shocks, those kinds of impacts. And you know, some of these older tanks, as impressive and amazing as they are, I'd be curious to see how many hairline fractures are in some of those hulls. Uh, my warrior for sure. I know Fine Well had some hairline fractures in some of the final drive housings uh, from people smashing into rocks and going over lumps too much. So it's pretty common and it's it's expected. So that's why after a certain period of time, vehicles go through non-destructive testing, they go through inspections, rigorous inspections. But a lot of vehicles that are getting these upgrade packages don't get that because the whole point of, you know, Upgrading these vehicles is to save money. Inspecting it and going through the, you know, the proper processes to repair damaged hulls and chassis costs just as much money as it would be to just upgrade the damn thing and hope for the best. The next, and probably one of the most pertinent points, is price versus combat value. This may depend on each particular case and vehicle, but often the increase in combat value of the retrofitted or upgraded vehicle is just not worth the cost. The price does not come down to the retrofit or upgrade alone, but also to the costs attached to it. A typical example of this would be the drastic change to the gun again on the T-55 with the 105mm L7s instead of the 100mm or new pattern upgrade by Raytheon that replaces the original 105mm M68 with the 120mm M256. Here, the vehicle owner not only has to pay for the retrofits, but also purchase whole new stocks of ammunition, training, and the time it takes to actually get this kind of equipment operational. Additional costs can also include actually getting the training completed, but also training new crews that are going to operate the vehicle for many years to come, that may have to actually learn to upgrade to another package, which is, again, pointless if it could just be standardized to one original platform and weapon system. This is for both operation and maintenance though, and additional maintenance tools would probably be needed in case of failure of equipment. Some cases entire facilities or entire sets of new parts may need to be produced to allow the infrastructure to support such vehicles put in place. These extra costs can largely defeat the entire purpose of a retrofit or upgrading older vehicles, which is truly down to affordability. A lot of people say that the upgrades will save money, but it's tough to say, you know, some packages I don't think are fully really vested in or at least researched to bring into the cost of viability. Retrofits as a viable solution, though, are still definitely out there. There are instances where retrofitting an older vehicle is definitely a very good solution. 
Please note though that these situations are highly individual and each case can be dependent on the particular set of circumstances that the tank is going into, whether it be its political environment that it's in, or the environment that it's going to fight in, or the uh, adversaries that it's going up against. But some of these include a modern vehicle improvement by the actual producer. This makes complete sense. Upgrades made to existing vehicles by specialized companies that were involved in their development, such as Rheinmetall and KMW and IBD for the Leopard 2, are highly reliable and certainly less costly than developing a new tank from scratch, and has been very successful for the Leopard 2 series. Also, new vehicles can sometimes just not be available. These cases are also very specific, but under certain circumstances purchasing new vehicles simply is just not an option. A good example would be North Korea, with its armoured forces consisting of retrofitted tanks of dubious quality. North Korea is under an arms import embargo, and without an advanced military industry of its own, it's practically impossible for it to develop a truly modern main battle tank that could stand up against South Korea's advanced technology. Another example would be Israel, which, several times during its existence, has been barred from purchasing advanced western vehicles such as the Chieftain. Israel's own ingenuity along with American military support has led to a series of advanced retrofitted vehicles before the eventual introduction of the Makava MBT program. There's also personal issues. The more modern vehicle there is, the more difficult it is to operate. The advanced battlefield control systems that western armies utilize require extensive training, which is not possible in some armies that consistently consist of conscripts that can't quite read too good, and if they can't read or are illiterate then you can't really be trained so well on actually operating more highly sophisticated technological systems. While a skilled but uneducated mechanic can keep a T-55 operational almost indefinitely, that cannot be said for some of the small modern systems such as the Abrams uh, that are out there today. Retrofitting older designs with modern technology allows both maintenance and vehicle crews to keep utilizing their training without having to start from scratch. There's also upkeep. Modern tanks are notoriously expensive to run. Few countries can afford to keep a large fleet of cutting edge tanks operational. On the other hand, T-72 parts are extremely easy to come by and are not expensive at all. Modern tanks though are for the most part not actually needed for the most battles that are out there today. Yes, we say that the tank is here to stay and I totally will stand by that, but as of right now, in terms of upgrading tanks to more modernized, brand new chassis, brand new tanks, it doesn't make a huge amount of sense. Right now, we're not engaging tank on tank warfare and we're still somewhat asymmetric in terms of the way we fight in the threats that are out there. That's changing a little bit now, but when you potentially put hostile neighbors, such as a handful of old patterns, against one another, you don't really need to purchase hundreds of modern tanks to deal with that kind of threat. This is especially typical for three regions of the world, Africa, Southeast Asia, and South America. Very old armored vehicles that can be still found in these parts of the world, with local militaries not facing any immediate need to upgrade their armor to something newer. Of course, in the more westernized world of America, Canada, NATO, and the Russian, states, uh, it's a little bit more prominent that we need more heavier, more modernized main battle tanks. But in conclusion, a large number of modified vehicles can currently be seen in both Syria and Ukraine. Lately, however, enticing offers from Chinese and Russian armor producers have caught the eyes of multiple customers, and with the export success and relative affordability of these vehicles such as the Russian T-90S and T-90MS tanks, it's possible that the age of the Cold War tank retrofitting is slowly coming to an end, and more modernized tanks are actually being procured and purchased straight from suppliers. Personally, I would love to see more new design tanks out there because it gets me talking about them more and learning about them and that's what I've always been fascinated about. I have no bias to any country or nation of tanks other than me loving the Challenger 2 just for what it is, but tanks around the world just fascinate me and the fact that they get upgraded to keep them rolling still is a good bonus in my eyes because I don't want to see things like the T-72 not rolling around anymore. I probably won't see it in my lifetime. But it's cool to see that there are companies out there trying their best to make these things work better for the modern day. And, you know, countries and people who can't afford to upgrade these kind of weapon systems are doing what they can to protect their troops uh, and to win the firefight and to win the battle. So, in the end of the day, they're trying what they can with what they have. I hope you enjoyed today's video, folks. Please leave me a like if you did enjoy it. Also, a comment if I did uh, make anything you want to talk about. If you want to be notified of any upcoming content in the future, please click the little bell by the subscribe button. It really does help me uh, share my content with you and you can kind of have a heads up of what's coming out. 
And also, if you want to support my channel, I really would appreciate you go check out my Patreon donation page, which is in the description box below. Thank you to everyone who's been donating and supporting to my channel. It really does mean a lot to me. And also, I do have my PayPal link there too, so if you don't want to use Patreon, I know a lot of people don't agree with Patreon, then you can use that link too. There's also some other social media links in the description box below, including Facebook, uh, Discord, Twitter, and my merchandise store. I hope you have a wonderful day, everyone. Please take care, and I'll see you next time. All the best. Bye-bye.